Tuesday, we'll continue with our Bible study on the book of Acts. This is a Zoom event that will be starting at 7 p.m. And if you wish to join, please email me at aritter at mbccc.org so I can send you the link to that. On Wednesday night, I will be asking those who are interested some trivia questions for uh, 45 minutes or so. That will be on the Meadowbrook Congregational Church Facebook page. So that's a Facebook live event. On Thursday, the Women's Faith Group will be meeting on Zoom. If you want to get a, to be a part of that group, contact Colleen Foster at mbccc.org to get a link for that class that's on Zoom. And then next Sunday, following worship, we're going to try something new. We're going to try a virtual fellowship hour. It will be a Zoom event, and it will start at 11 o'clock, so an hour after this service starts. You'll need to have a link for Zoom for the event, and you can get that by emailing Colleen Foster at cfoster at mbccc.org. It'll be fun to have all of our faces on the screen together. Uh, we can see each other's faces. We can check in on one another. And it may be uh, organized chaos, but it will be fun organized chaos. So if you're interested in that, let Colleen know. All of this information that I just went over will be available in the Monday Messenger. That will be an email sent out from the church office tomorrow. We're grateful to you for doing your best to keep your pledges updated. You can send your checks to the church. You can uh, send your gifts electronically through Venmo or PayPal. Your support in this difficult time is most important and greatly appreciated. The risen Christ was the disciples' companion on the road to Emmaus. This morning we seek the risen Christ at our side in our journey of faith, on life pathways and in every life's encounter. Open our eyes to recognize God's presence this morning from our separate paths. May the Spirit bring us together and seek our God. Let us pray. Gracious God, kindle anew in us a desire to proclaim your word. In this time of worship, may your good news illuminate us. May our hearts burn to bear witness to it. Grant us the courage to make ourselves vulnerable to bring to you our fears and our troubles, and to find your hope in the promise that is everlasting. We pray these things in the name of Jesus the Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture lesson this morning will once again be read by Laura Ritter. Our scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 13 through 49. Now on that same day, two of the men were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a mighty prophet in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. And moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning. And when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who had said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, wow. How foolish you are, and how slow to heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. 
Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it's almost evening, and the day is nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made to know, be known to them in the breaking of the bread. May God give us understanding and sight from this reading of his word. Thank you, Lord. Several years ago, the Washington Post conducted a, a social experiment. They took Joshua Bell, who was one of the best violinists in the entire world, and they set him up to play at a metro subway station in the heart of Washington, D.C. Earlier that year, Bell was voted the, one of the best classical musicians in America, and he had played to sold-out crowds in many cities. On that particular morning, he started playing about 7.45 a.m., right in the middle of all the rush hour commuters, he was wearing a long-sleeved t-shirt, blue jeans, and a baseball cap. He put his violin case out, he put in a couple dollars, and he played to see how much attention and how much money he could garner. He used his own violin, one valued at $3.5 million, and he played six classical pieces in a style and manner that few artists could match. A hidden camera documented everything that happened. A total of three minutes and 63 people passed before Bell, before finally a middle-aged man altered his gait for just a second and turned his head and, and listened to the music. A little bit later, Bell got his first donation, a dollar, thrown into the case. In all, he played for 43 minutes, those six pieces. Seven people stopped and stood nearby to listen. It's estimated that 1,070 people hurried by, oblivious to the musical master who was playing before them for free. Inside Bell's violin case was a whopping $32, $20 of which was donated by the only person who recognized Bell from a concert the night before at the Library of Congress. Most of the money in the violin case was pennies. Few people that morning recognized the beauty of the music, the talent of Joshua Bell. Not many even saw him playing. Only one knew who he was. Their heads were down, their eyes straight ahead, their minds focused on the world as they knew it to be that morning. Last Sunday night we had a session of our B3, the pub theology discussion group that meets here at Meadowbrook Monthly. We've not met since the stay-at-home discipline has begun, but Sunday we met through Zoom technology. After checking in with everybody to see how we were experiencing life through the pandemic, I tossed out a simple yet profound question. Where have you experienced God in your current situation? In the spirit of the season, I rephrased the question to, where have you experienced the risen Christ in the midst of your life this past month? There were lots of good answers, some I expected. People saw the presence of God, the risen Christ, and the actions of doctors and nurses and medical workers who have been brave and unselfish and compassionate. Some people saw the presence of God in those who risked their health providing safety and essential services. Some people saw the presence of God in hospitality and concern of family and friends. But the responses got even more interesting and perhaps a little more unexpected. One person said they found the presence of God in understanding those things beyond the ordinary. Seeing and, and suddenly cherishing things that are eternal, that have been elevated above normal 
concerns for us, concerns of work and meeting and leisure. Someone spoke up about gratitude and appreciation and suddenly become aware of all that others do for our own lives. Another person talked about the realization of what is important, the meaning of life. I believe that because of the current situation, all of us are more likely to reflect upon our lives more and to understand more clearly where God is, where God has been, and where God's promise will be for our future. The bottom line, I think, is that the current pandemic has taken the blinders off many of us. What we deemed as crucial and important just a couple weeks ago suddenly doesn't seem as crucial and important. We're in a place where we more readily appreciate the gifts of our work and the labors of others. We're in a place where we better understand the sacrifice that comes with ordinary compassion. We're in a place where we look upon the world with a, a fresh perspective, one that views our lives from a transcendent and holy angle rather than the immediate utilitarian perspective that we've been so used to using. The scripture lesson that Laura read for the, this third Sunday of Easter is that familiar story of the journey on the road to Emmaus. Emmaus was a village located about seven miles from Jerusalem, perhaps the hometown of one of the two men, the two followers of Jesus who were walking there that morning. As they walked, they talked about the death of Jesus, they talked about the rumors of his resurrection, but certainly they talked about the disappointment they held in their hearts. Jesus was gone, their dreams, their plans were shattered. Their words express a lot of failure and regret. They wanted things to be normal. They wanted things to go back to the way they were used to having them. But this new normal was going to be one without the presence and promise of Jesus. That one sentence says it all. We had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. We had hoped. Suddenly Jesus appeared to them as a stranger. He asked them about their conversation. He reminded them of the promises he had once made to them. But their eyes were kept from seeing him and their minds were kept from understanding what he was saying. At the end of their walk, they shared a meal together. Jesus took bread, he blessed it, he passed it to them. And suddenly their eyes were opened. They saw him. At that very moment, he vanished from their sight. But also at that very moment, they began to understand what Jesus was talking about as they walked on that road to Emmaus. Their hearts began to burn with inspiration and meaning. The Lord has indeed risen. Their perspective on life suddenly changed. They were moving on to a new normal. But that new normal would not be in the same old things. They were resurrection people now. Now they were living out their daily lives in the promise of new life. I think we're all in a place like those disciples leaving for the walk to Emmaus. This pandemic has given us things that are perhaps more than we think we can handle. Our world's been turned upside down. What's next? What do we do? Where do we go with our lives? Will things change soon? Will things ever change? It's a place of pain, sorrow, and loss, and fear, and doubt. We don't want to stay in that place. We want to get back to normal. We want to get back to a place where life is predictable. We want to get back to the routine. In the midst of this, though, some of us are having this Emmaus experience. We're discovering the hand of God that has always been behind things, but perhaps we've taken it for granted. We've overlooked it. We're seeing something sacred suddenly in the gifts of our friends and family, in the sacrifice of others, in how we use our time. We're feeling more connected to the holy, taken off the treadmill of obligation, able to cherish those things that are truly important. Our eyes have been opened to a new way of seeing, to a new recognition, to a community of welcome and hospitality and love. God hasn't abandoned us. God's there in our fear and our worry, providing us with hope and promise. The risen Christ is there just as always, only now we see it and we understand it better. There will come a time when we enter a new normal. Like those disciples, we'll leave Emmaus, we'll go back to our Jerusalem. But that Jerusalem will no longer be the same place it used to be. 
Jerusalem won't be the old routine, the old habits, the old way of seeing our work, our friends, our family, our church, our place in the world. Jerusalem will be a place of new life. It will be a new normal where we take our new understandings and and try to live them out in the priorities and choices and decisions we have. We will be partners in the resurrection life of Jesus. There's been a popular meme this week on Facebook quoted by Brene Brown but written by Sonia Renee Taylor. We will not go back to normal. Normal never was. Our pre-corona existence was not normal other than we normalized greed and inequity and exhaustion, depletion, extraction, disconnection, confusion and rage and hoarding and hate and lack. We should not long to return to this, my friends. We're given the opportunity to stitch a new garment, one that fits all of humanity and nature. In that meal at Emmaus, Jesus wasn't just giving his followers bread. He was giving them back their true self. He was restoring them to the gift of real life. As we look to what is ahead for us, may these days be a portal to greater self-awareness, to a vision of the fullness of God, to an appreciation of ourselves and those around us. May the new normal, whatever it might be, not be a return to what was, but an understanding that something better is yet to be created by the hands of God, inspired by the risen Christ. Let us pray. Oh God, you have come to us in unexpected places and times. You came to those disciples on a dusty road, in the midst of their conversation with their friends, in the midst of a shared meal, in the stillness of remembering a story. We pray that you will come to us this morning through the miracle of technology. In our living rooms, our studies, our kitchens. In our yearning to see and to be with one another again. Come into our midst. Come into our doubt, our fear, our sorrow. And come in the power of the resurrection. In that power we know that no pain, no suffering, no death is unknown to you. We know you understand. We know that you redeem. We know that you are with us. Bring us to peace. In places where there is anxiety and trouble, in places where there is bloodshed and violence, in places where people cannot rest or relax, in places where demands and needs must be met, Bring us peace. Bring us hope. In hearts that experience sorrow and loss, in bodies that are sick and in need of healing, in situations where there seems to be only disease and death, in times where it feels like good news is so far away, bring us hope. Bring to us faith. In minds that see only news of virus and isolation. In dreams that have been shattered by plans that had to be canceled. In a tomorrow that seems like it will look just like this day. Bring to us faith. Come before us in new life, O God. Surprise us with our own vision of the risen Lord. Renew us with expectations of beauty and wonder. Open our eyes to see your victory in the midst of life today. We pray for the sick, for the suffering, for those who are afflicted with the virus, for those who face other concerns of health. We pray for those who are mourning the loss of family and friends. We pray for doctors and nurses and health care workers, for public safety officers, for those working so hard to keep our daily needs supplied. We pray for those alone and isolated, for families and loved ones who cannot be together. We pray for patience and understanding among those who share shelter together. 
We pray for those who have lost jobs, for those whose salaries have been diminished, for those who have had dreams deferred or canceled. We pray for our leaders, for those whose decisions affect us all. We ask for them to make wise choices that produce what is best for each and every one. Hear these, our prayers this morning, O God, these spoken words and prayers that come from our faithful hearts, prayers whispered from places that are distant but brought together by this worship service this morning. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you again so much for taking the time to join us for worship this morning. We do miss you. I love you, and I hope that it's not long until we see each other again. Know that we'll be here again next Sunday, and know of those events that I mentioned at the beginning of the service. There will be a Monday messenger coming to you by email that you'll be able to see specific things about those events. We hope that you can join us. Keep in prayer, keep in touch with one another through uh, Facebook, through text, through phone calls, through notes and letters. And now the service has ended. May the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the peace and strength and encouragement of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and all days to come. Amen. Please be well. I love you.